Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. For this tutorial, we're going to discuss best practices for data validation tests in SQL Server. To get started, open a browser and set the URL to github.com slash data research labs, all one word. Hit enter. Go down to you see the SQL Scripts project there or there. Click it. Scroll down until you see the data validation scripts link. Click that. And then scroll down to SQL Server until you see the best practices and click that link. And there in GitHub, you'll have all of the different best practices. Oh, our dog's going nuts in the background. Someone must be at the door. Now let's walk through the sample validation test. Let's start with test case 62, which is going to take us beyond the simple two state pass and fail that we've been using on the test cases up until now. This is going to add warnings and skips. In GitHub, you can expand this and read all the details about what's going on. I'm just going to shortcut it here and say that uh, this block, this common table expression is deriving the data under test for a table. And this is the business logic layer. And the business logic layer is basically saying, hey, the status can be a pass, but only after it passes the uh, fail and warning. And so if the region ID is less than 10% or greater than 50%, it's not between the two, then fail because it's really bad. But if the region ID, the frequency at which it occurs in the table is greater than 10% but less than 25% because we've already checked for it up there, or it's between 35 and 50%, that's the warning range between those two or between these two. So if you have this test running daily and you only had pass or fail state, you might find out, oh, it started failing. But it'd be nice to have a warning set up so that you start to have a couple of days notice. Hey, this went from passing all the time. Now it's a warning, a warning, a warning every day. And it'll alert you to it before it gets really bad and starts failing. So that's how you would use one example of how you'd use a warn. And finally, down here, the SQL that wraps it all up, we go in and say, hey, if the count from BLL equals zero, then skip the whole test case. So what's that about? Basically, this is a handy, it's like a test setup, test teardown. And part of your test setup is, hey, there's, there's no data at all. <laughs> there's no results. And if there's no results, skip the test. We don't want it to be a fail. We don't want it to be a warn. We just want to skip it because sometimes something goes to run and it can't because the server's down. Well, sometimes you want that to be a fail. Other times you want it to be a skip. Uh, and then it's going to say, oh, if the count had any fails in it, then the entire run is a fail. And if, if it didn't have any fails, but it had warns, then it's a warn. And if it has none of those, it's a pass. So that's what that's doing. Let's move along to test case number 63. This test case is about limiting your test to recent data. There's lots of good reasons why. Performance is the biggest one. When you have a giant table and five or six years of data, and that data hasn't changed, why test it over and over again? You really, if you're going to run it daily, just test the last day. That's the new delta of data. So that's one reason to limit to recent data. And then there's other reasons too. So how do you do that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. You, in your table, in this case, demo HR countries, you have to find some column, some field, that's a date last updated. That's critical. And if you don't have date last updated and you have a numeric ID that's an integer that increments by one, you could get away with doing that and look at, say, the last 1,000 or 5,000 rows or whatever's a reasonable approximation of the last day. But ideally, you have some field that's a uh, last updated field. And you would just say, hey, if in this case, we're looking at right now, get date, minus 30 days. So we're saying, hey, analyze only the last 30 days of data and look for region ID is null and do a fail check on that. Moving along to test case 64, this is an example of a best practice where you want to ignore known fails that aren't going to be fixed. So I've had situations where a test case is running fine for a year, two years, three years, and then all of a sudden it starts failing. So then I go do the research, talk to the appropriate people and find out, you know what, they're never going to fix it. You need to fix it or turn it off. And if they're not going to fix it, then turn off that test case. So in this case, in this case here, for whatever reason, in the test data, we know that country IDs, or these, these three countries have some issue, and they're not going to be fixed, so we just want to exclude it from our test. So our test started out without this line in there, ran for a while, and then over time, these three are broken. They're not going to get fixed. Fine. Exclude them. 
with a not in clause, but keep running the test without them. Move along to test case 65. This is where you do a single large table scan for performance reasons. Uh, all the prior validation tests up until now, tests one through 65, the tests were just granular and standalone. So it's easy to follow the examples on screen. However, reality is you usually don't have individual little test cases. Sometimes you can. If they run quick, it's nice to have a individual granular test case show up as a line in a report so you know what failed. But other times, you don't want that for performance reasons. If it takes one or two minutes per test to run and you have 50 of them, you don't want 50 minutes to run. You want to bundle 30, 40, all 50 of them up into a single large single table scan pass so it takes one or two minutes rather than 50 to execute. Uh, there's a whole bunch of details in here in the example, and it shows you the inner query, and it shows you, here's an example of a case when. This is actually taking many of the test cases from up above that were each individual tests, and it's rolling them all into one big table scan pass. So if the employee ID is less than 100, trigger rejection code one. If it's greater than uh, 999, trigger rejection code two. The salary commission, these are a bunch of the numeric tests that we did several videos ago, but it has them all lined up as their own individual rejection codes. Uh, here we're looking for a line feed or a carriage return or a tab character or a non-breaking space. And it has all that logic all built out into one big case statement. So you can see why that's a problem. If the zip five failed, then the status field is going to short circuit at zip five and that's it. It'll say, hey, status is rejection code five, I'm done. But what if this one and this one and this one are also failing? You won't know it because they won't run. That's a disadvantage of case sales statement. But the performance is so important that many times you'll want to do this anyway. And maybe you'll bundle, you know, do a bunch of numeric tests and then do a separate one with some wacky character checks, etc. Even that is better than running each of these. If so, that's what that's the reasoning and the thinking behind bundling these all in one big table scan. Move along to test case 66. This is a great best practice when you want to use config tables to parameterize your entire test script. We expand this. So basically, we uh, drop the temp table if it exists. It shouldn't. Each time you run, it gets wiped. And we create a temp, temp table with pound test case config is the name, and we have two fields, a property name, var car, and a property value, var car. And then we're going to insert into that configuration table, number of days to look back, 100, and max number of rows to return, five. Select the uh, top five rows, basically. And if we want our test cases, you know, if we have 150 test cases, we don't want to hard code select top five, select top five. We just want one value here. And so we would just go change this at the top of the script and be done. And then the number of days to look back. If we want to look back only five days or 10 days, we just change it one place right here in our config table at the top of the script. So that's how you set up a config table in SQL Server, just a temp table, top of your script, population values. And how do you use it? Basically, let's look at the inner query. The outer query is just trying to return a pass or a fail. So ignore that. What's in blue is what we're going to focus on. And specifically, we'll even go to the inner query down here. And the inner query down here says, select the count of rows from demo HR countries where the date last updated is greater than right now, get date, minus, and here's where we use our config table, minus select, cast the property value as an integer of the where the row, the, where the property name is the number of days to look back. So give me the row where property name is the number of days to look back and get the property value from that row, convert it to an integer from the pound test table. And take the time right now and subtract the number of days to look back from that. So how many rows count are in demo HR countries where the date last updated is within the last 30 days, 100 days, whatever we configure here. And finally, test case 67, there's no code. It's just the concept of a test case layout and some design considerations. So, and it's a best practice. Up to this point, all the SQL that you've seen is not how I would lay out a script. These are just snippets that are put in place to make it easy to see groupings of numeric test cases. 
uh, text test cases, regular expression test cases, etc. But actually, the way you should organize your test cases is different. I typically found that organizing tests by table and then in field order is best. And I focus on validating each table one by one, and I title the test cases that way so that they sort nicely as well. So that's just a suggestion, but I'm sure you'll find your way too. And uh, if you have any best practices of your own, put them in the comments on this video. Thank you for watching, and please, if you found this video helpful, click like and subscribe. Also, check out our other videos and related playlists in the boxes to the right.